Hey guys, Navin out on No Limit Hold'em. Today we're going to be talking again about this idea of uh, range efficiency, range utopia, however you want to say it. Um, basically using the right tools for the right jobs. Uh, we have gone into this a little bit, a few times, a couple times at least, uh, with regard to pre-flop play. Um, so we're going to focus more on post-flop here. Uh, again, these uh, principles, the guiding principles of range efficiency. Uh, you could say, waste not, want not, a place for everything, everything in its place. These thoughts should come to mind. Um, economy of motion uh, from martial arts. Uh, I mean, there's lots of uh, different ways that you can frame it in your mind. Whatever way helps you to keep it in mind when you're constructing ranges is, uh, is just fine. Uh, but basically, uh, we don't want to waste the value of our hands. Uh, we want to construct ranges where each part of our range can do a good bit of work for us. Uh, we're not going to take any one action all of the time, so we might as well use the hands that make sense or are most suited for the particular situation uh, at hand. Uh, again, these aren't just pre-flop concepts. Um, if you take them uh, from pre-flop and then you start getting into them, uh, applying these principles, post-flop, the idea is it's going to kind of clean up your lines, uh, make things less cumbersome and more optimized and streamlined. Um, we need to select the right hands for the right jobs and often trying to choose hands that we get good mileage out of, hands that do good work for us, a lot of work for us in a particular situation. Uh, maybe in a spot uh, we will have a lot of hands that we want to bet, but then we're going to have some subgroup of hands that we want to check back. And if we want to have some, like, single pairs that check back, uh, they can call at least us street. And then uh, we want to have some draws that check back so that we don't have to just give up the pot when we check back and then the third heart comes on a turn, for instance. Uh, maybe putting combo draws in your check back range would, would kind of be the ideal solution. I mean, you might want to have more than just combo draws. It depends on the situation, but... Um, you know, a combo draw, like pair plus draw, especially if it's not a good top pair plus draw, uh, can make a really good check back uh, because it, it'll give you uh, some lines that are going to check back, call the turn, fold the river, which gives your opponent incentive to bluff, uh, double pair bluff. Uh, if you don't have any hands like that, then your opponent can just stop doing it, and that's no good. Um, if you... Uh, if you never have a hand that checks back and then raises the turn or checks back, calls the turn and raises the river, then that's going to be um, exploitable also. Um, so that's why pair plus draws make a lot of sense because you know, your, your hand is going to be kind of showdown value um, and then some of the time you're just going to have to call one street, give it up on the river. Uh, sometimes you can call like both uh, river, uh, turn and river, maybe you make two pair. Um, and then, or trips, or if you actually hit your draw, you might make a good uh, raising hand. And also, if you're going to have some hands that are legitimately calling the turn and raising the river, then that also means that you're able to, and really ought to, open a bluffing range that uh, checks back the flop, calls the turn, and raises the river. Uh, that's a weird line. It's an intricate line. It's a spot that a lot of players aren't used to being put in, and that's the kind of spots where people make a lot of mistakes. Um, so, yeah, your your job is to think of this stuff off the table. Get your ranges worked out, and this is really the difference between a good player and a not-so-good player. Uh, a really good player has a predefined strategy. Um, they know that they're going to adjust that strategy in certain situations, but they know really what reasons there are to adjust their strategy and uh, in what direction they're going to take their strategy if those reasons uh, happen <clears throat> or occur, come to light. Uh, so, therefore, the adjustments actually become part of the strategy that they have put together from off the table. So when you're actually on the felt, you shouldn't be having to do a whole lot of thinking. You know, still some thinking, but your thinking should be mostly about um, your opponent's ranges. Your thinking should be mostly about figuring out what the bad guys are up to. Um, 
not so much thinking about what you should do with a given hand in a given spot, except in relation to uh, deviations from norm that you're going to make to your ranges and lines based on what you've been able to figure out uh, about your opponents. Um, very basically, and some of these, uh, I don't know, the, the distinctions between nutted value and value might be kind of arbitrary uh, some of the time, uh, not so distinct. Uh, same with value and showdown value, bluff catcher. Uh, then you'll have hands that, you know, you could look at it as a draw or error, you know, that, uh, like maybe two over cards with three to the nut flush and three to the broadway straight, ace high, you know, maybe that's showdown value in some spots, maybe you could look at it as a draw, um, you know, but sometimes it's just error, and, and, and these are admittedly kind of arbitrary uh, distinctions, but to the degree that they're specific, you can say specific things about them. Um, and before we get into, like, you know, two over cards with backdoor flush draw, um, removal effects, blocker effects, uh, you know, card removal, um, I want to just talk about the, the, the more basic things. Um, and one of the big things that you want to do, and this is one of the things that constructing your ranges off the table and not trying to figure it out while you're in game is going to help you do is stop wasting hands. You know, going to stop turning perfectly good hands uh, that would have value as bluff catchers into bluffs by, you know, betting and raising with them. Um, you're going to stop wasting uh, those same, like, middle strength hands. You're going to stop, like, check calling flop and then leading turn with them and just kind of probing or making weak leads and uh, putting yourself in tough spots or going for, like, three streets of value with top here, no kicker type stuff, getting raised at some point and hating life. Uh, and, and really making a lot of mistakes because you don't have a clear and easy answer because you kind of put yourself in a silly spot. Um, you really, and I, I want to add the caveat that usually you should not slow play your, your big hands. Um, and what people will say, and I've coached people recently that kind of had this idea, is, uh, well, I've got this really big hand, um, so I don't want to let my opponent get off the hook without putting any money into the pot. Plus, I figure if I, like, I don't know, check the flop back with second set, middle set, um, I can induce bluffs and I can uh, <clears throat> get lighter call downs. Uh, but the thing is, is that th those, like, nutted value hands, those are the only hands that you're going to have in your range that are going to allow you to stack your opponent. So you've got to use them for that purpose. You've got other hands in your range that you can use to like chuck back and pick off bluffs. Uh, you don't need to do that with with your your best hands. <clears throat> there are there are exceptions to that, which we'll talk about later on in the video. Um, but just as a very general rule, uh, you should use your strong hands to go for maximum value, and that's what those hands are best at, right? Like. What's the nut flush best at? It's best at stacking the second nut flush. That's why you've got it. That's what it's good for. Um, and some things to understand and take away from this, uh, if you're not used to thinking in this manner, if you've got some of these kind of antiquated notions uh, like flowing around in your mind or kind of attached to your poker soul, uh, the way that the money goes in matters. It's not enough to just say, well, I was going to call anyway, so I figured I may as well bet, because if I bet, that gives me more ways to win the pot, blah, 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 blah. If you've got like a mediocre bluff catcher type hand, and you bet and get called, oftentimes you're betting and getting called by better. Sometimes you bet, <clears throat> and you get raised either by a value hand or a bluff, and you have to fold a hand um, after having put money in. And uh, some of the time, uh, you're getting uh, hands to fold, but you beat all those hands because your hand is a middle strength hand. So the, the hands that are gonna uh, that you're ahead of are gonna fold, and the hands that are ahead of you are gonna either call or raise. Um, but if you use the same part of your range um, as a check, either like checking back the flop and uh, calling the turn, or um, uh, once the flop does go, check check maybe. Uh, you check the turn again. I mean, it, these all depend very much on your opponent and the actual board state and a lot of things. But just as a general idea, when you have a middle strength hand for whatever the situation is, um, if the money goes in by you checking and calling, 
the money goes in against a wider and more bluff heavy weaker range um, so when you have a middle strength hand you don't want to bet and fold out the hands that you can beat and get called by hands that beat you and raised by a mix of hands that beat you and maybe some bluffs doesn't matter because you can't call um, <clears throat> your hand and, and you know a lot of this comes down to this idea like understanding showdown value the, this idea that your hand doesn't matter unless it goes to showdown like if at some point you fold or if at some point your opponent folds um, it doesn't really matter what you're holding it's only when you actually get to showdown that that makes your hand uh, a part of the process like well um, a part of the end result so um, if you're barreling off and you're hoping that your opponent folds and you've got some mediocre hand and you get your opponent to fold, well, congratulations, but you may as well have used the bottom of your range to do that with, right? Um, or if, uh, you know, so when you have like a, a really strong value hand, then you want to bet it for value, hoping to get it to showdown against your opponent's calling range. <clears throat> Whereas if you have a bluffing hand, you want to, you know, um, if you've decided it's a good spot to bluff, you want to uh, bet hoping that your opponent doesn't call you and you don't have to go to showdown so your hand doesn't matter. Um, so a lot of the confusion and misunderstandings about the way to play post-flop, I think they come from this, this spot right here. Uh, it matters how money goes in. Your hand doesn't count unless there's a showdown. So when you're I don't even pre-flop, I think it's probably easier to explain this with a pre-flop example. If you're playing, um, let's say you're in the cutoff seat, and the player in the hijack is a pretty good player, pretty, uh, like, moderately aggressive, somewhere between a tag and a lag, um, and he open raises the, uh, uh, the hijack, and you're in the cutoff playing full ring. Uh, if you look down at, like, King Jack suited, um, if you three bet that hand, your opponent's probably not going to make many mistakes against you. He's going to fold the hands that you beat, some of them you dominate, um, weaker jack axe, weaker king axe, and he's going to continue with a hand range that's probably ahead of king jack suited, um, or he may come back over the top, you're probably going to have to fold, and he could do that with a balance range, um, and sometimes you'll be folding the best hand. So if you're going to three bet something in a spot like that, you want to three bet hands like aces, kings, queens, ace, king, hands that not only are better than some of your opponent's continuing hands, or a lot of your opponent's continuing hands, um, but hands that continue if he comes back over the top, and hands that dominate a lot of the hands that he's going to flat call you with. I mean, that's really where a lot of the value of coming comes from, uh, from starting with the best hand. Just having, like, the best hand when your opponent has two live cards, it's not that big a deal. It, it doesn't become a real big factor until you dominate your opponent's hand. Uh, so you know, where he can make a good second best hand. You know, where you have ace-king and he calls with ace-queen, or you've got pocket aces and he calls with uh, queens, or you've got pocket aces and he's got uh, king-queen, but the flop comes out queen-high or king-high. You know, those are the spots where you're going to be able to really get value out of your opponent post-flop. Um, if you're making a three-bet with, like, king-jack or something like that, and you're really hoping your opponent folds, um, if you've got a hand that splits the gap between the hands your opponent's likely to open-raise and the hands that your opponent is likely to continue against the three bet with, then probably you should be flat calling. You know, you've got card advantage or range advantage, however you want to look at that. Um, card advantage, I guess, would be the best way to look at this <clears throat> with a specific hand, right? So if you have uh, the probable best hand, you've got a hand that plays good post flop, uh, you've got position and hopefully some kind of a uh, skill edge, and that's all you can ask for. Going post flop, there is no other way to make money strongest hand, um, best, uh, well, position, I guess you could say, uh, best position, or just having position, and uh, having a skill advantage. There are no other advantages. If you go to the flop out of position against a superior opponent with a weaker range, uh, you have the weaker hand. Uh, you cannot win in the long run. It's impossible. There's no other way to, to generate edge. Um, <clears throat> if your opponent can't make mistakes against your whatever your option that you choose to exercise uh, is, um, or if you can't set them up to make mistakes uh, later on in the hand. Uh, basically, if you're not generating mistakes, you're not making money. Um, if, you, if, you're, if you're taking a line 
that almost forces your opponent to play perfectly against you, like check raising top pair bottom kicker on the flop, or uh, you know going super aggro with second pair. Uh, your opponent's probably not going to do a lot of folding with hands that uh, that beat you, and he's not going to be calling with much that you beat or anything that you beat. Uh, then you're just wasting your hand. Uh, and that's what we're talking about here, is if we can play every part of our range as efficiently as possible, then we leave nothing on the table, especially when we nail down bet sizing. Um, you know, we really have to bring targeting and things like that uh, into the conversation before we can discuss uh, bet sizing. I've got a video on it where we talk about it. but So looking at each part of your range and thinking, what is this part of my range good for? So nutted value is good at just going for maximum value, hoping to get called down by strong second best hands in your opponent's range. No other part of your range can do that. So if you ever want to stack your opponent, you've got to use the nutted value parts of your range to do it. Um, a value hand is good for maybe betting flop, betting turn, check calling, or, you know, it depends on how strong the value hand is, but it's often good for just getting two or three bets in, um, either by uh, betting ones, uh, maybe bet, flop, check, call, turn, check, call, river. Uh, sometimes you'll be betting, flop, check, calling, turn, and then check, calling, river, or uh, calling, flop, calling, turn, and then betting the river once it's checked. Uh, that's what your value hands are good for. Um, and these hand values can change and warp uh, on a street by street basis. You know, if you've got like top pair with a pretty good kicker, uh, but then the turn card comes down, it's higher than your top pair, well your hand just made its way from a value hand to more like showdown value. So understanding when those changes take place that you ought to change your lines up um, and change your game plan it is a big part of the game too. <clears throat> uh, draws are good for different things really. If your opponents don't really understand bat sizing um, and they're very bad at folding once you make your hand, then maybe draws are good at uh, you know, chat calling and uh, hoping to get paid off when you make your bet. But often, uh, your draws are going to be good or, well, best used as bluffs to balance out your nutted value range and your value range. Um, you know, check raising some of your draws and chat calling some of your draws is probably a good strategy. Or leading uh, some of your draws and uh, and chat calling or chuck raising some of them. It, again, this all depends on pre-flop ranges, who... Uh, who has the more capped range, who has the more bound range, who's got the more uh, mediocre merged range. Um, but I think just a major and very common leak that a lot of players have is they just tend to turn the, turn their hands into just napkins when there actually is value in having the hand that they have. They play it as if there's not, or they play it in a way that makes it so there's not. Um, a lot of like mediocre to bad players tend to suck the value out of their hands by um, getting the money to go into the flop in ways that are not advantageous for the exact hand that we have in a given uh, spot. So if we can break that, that's fantastic. Um, when we're playing all, on offense, like we were pre-flop raiser, uh, or you could take this to post-flop and just say we were the last streets aggressor, we're often going to want to have hands that bet for value, hands that uh, fold to a raise after betting for value, uh, hands that will bet for value and continue in some way, uh, and then hands that bet as a bluff and fold. And sometimes, and some players, you'll even need to have hands that bet for uh, bet as a bluff, and then after getting raised, they uh, continue by coming back over the top. Uh, we often need hands that are going to go for one street, hands that will go for two streets, uh, hands that will go for, uh, you know, between two and three streets, depending on how the money goes in, like willing to call three streets or um, bet for value on two streets and then check back. <clears throat> on defense, we can't just be folding our entire checking range. So if we're in a spot where we called pre-flop, uh, we can't just like lead all of our hands uh, that we don't want to check and fold. And then every time we check, the villain knows it's free lunch. He can just bet and take the pot. Um, we're going to have to have some hands that check and call uh, one street or else our opponent will have no incentive to double barrel bluff us, which can work out pretty badly for us. Um, we're going to have to have some hands that want to check and call one street, check and uh, call the second street, and then check fold most rivers. Um, we're going to need to really have all of this stuff worked out 
Um, and it's going to be too late by the time you get to a specific flop to try to figure all this stuff out. You've really got to do some off-table work. And uh, Well, if you uh, want to get coaching, I can help you with that. That's one of the things that I uh, try to stress either by going through hand uh, examples that I bring into the coaching um, or uh, when we... Uh, one of the things I've been doing a lot of lately uh, is we'll start a session with a recorded session that a guy played um, online but with no narration and uh, we'll just watch it together and we'll pause it at the same time and talk about specific spots and we can you know then look at these specific flops and say okay well we're going to want to have some hands that check call here some hands that check raise and some hands that check fold um, and we're going to want to have some draws in the check call range and some in the uh, check raise range and try to make sense of it from there and then when you get your head around enough spots like that you start to build up intuition you don't have to relearn these things for every flop you just have to get your head around some basic ideas and, and really build up intuition that you can bring into um, other situations and that's the difference between an okay and a good poker player is they uh, the, the more spots you know how to handle more or less optimally or pretty close to correctly or more or less well <clears throat> the better you are and uh, you get that way by I don't think if you just played every day for the rest of your life and never did any off table work I don't think you'd ever get there <clears throat> so it's a mixture of those things um, so revisiting the roles of the hand categories uh, your nutted value hands want to go for everything possible most of the time your value hands want to go for two or three streets, um, but maybe want to take some pot control lines, um, especially on certain runouts. Uh, if you've got showdown value, you want to induce and catch bluffs with it. Keep the pot small. Try to just get your hand to showdown, where if it gets to showdown without a lot of action, it wins. But if it gets to showdown with a lot of action, especially if the action comes from your aggression, it loses. Uh, <clears throat> just keep in mind that when you take an aggressive action, what that does is it folds out a percent of your opponent's range, and it folds out the weakest hands in, in their range, and therefore it leaves in the strongest parts of their range. And think about whether that's good or bad for the particular hand you have in a given situation. Uh, traps, <clears throat> when you do have a spot where you want to trap, these traps are going to try to induce bluffs, uh, and uh, we want to do this uh, mm, sparingly, because mostly we're going to use, like, the strongest hands in our range, like the nutted value hands, the mo like the virtual or complete actual nuts. <clears throat> uh, but the way to think about how these ranges interact, your nutted value hands protect your big bluffs. Like if you're if you have a nutted value hand that's going to check raise flop, uh, flop, bomb the turn and jam the river, then that allows you to play bluffs in the same way, profitably or at least breaking even. Uh, with the bluffs. <clears throat> um, when you have a value hand, those value hands are going to balance against your just kind of single, double, sometimes three street bluffs. Um, any aggressive range has to have some value hands and has to have some bluffs. Um, or you're going to be imbalanced and highly exploitable. And if you just always have it when you take a specific action, it really isn't going to take a rocket scientist to figure that out. And they're going to beat you up for it. Um, even when you've got the nutted value hand and you go for the check raise, if your opponent makes a fold against you that he ought not be able to make, like he's got top pair with something, like some kind of top pair, and he folds correctly versus the check raise on the flop, that's like crushing your soul. I mean, just because you won the pot doesn't mean you didn't get owned. Um, if your opponent is able to get away from a hand that he should never be able to get away from when you have the best hand, he owned you. That's another type of ownage or ownership. <clears throat> Showdown value protects the hands that you want to check back and then just give up with. If every time we check back the flop, we're folding on the turn, our opponent can uh, just take the pot away from us with his entire range. He can bet like the very bottom of his range with complete impunity. <clears throat> we don't want that, so we have to have some hands that check back and call down if we're going to have some hands that check back and give up. And if we have the ability to mix in some hands that are going to check back and then sometimes raise after being let into, then that means 
we can do it for value, we can do it as a bluff. Um, so where do the traps come in? Now this could be eye-opening. If you've never heard this before, I expect you to really get your thinking cap going. Um, the traps in your range are only there to protect your showdown value. <clears throat> that's it. That's what their, that's what, that's what their job is. Um, because if every time you check back the flop, you either have just a weak bluff catcher or showdown value type hand, or air that you're going to fold, uh, then your opponent can like overbet the flop, overbet jam. I'm sorry, overbet the turn, overbet jam the river, and there's nothing you can do about it. You're just folding 100% of the time. You can do that with a balanced and polarized range, and you can't you can't stop it. Um, having just a couple of traps in your um, arsenal or having like a trap or two in a specific spot, it does a lot of work for you. That can do an awful lot of work because your opponent doesn't have to run into that trap very often uh, when he's over betting the turn and then over bet jamming the river. He doesn't have to run into a trap very often to make it very expensive for him to try to do that. Um, so in that way, your traps protect when your opponent's trying to exploit uh, the fact that you have an unbalanced um, air only, well, not even air only, but air and weak um, capped range when you check back the flop. Um, so in a spot where you're going to have some check backs or some check calls, um, if you're going to have kind of a lot of them, or if this is going to be a big part of your strategy and you're playing against a, an observant opponent, a thinking player, then you probably are going to need to bring some traps into your arsenal. Um, and the way that works is in two ways. Number one, um, once your opponent runs into a trap, uh, he's not going to be able to just beat you up by aggressively attacking your capped ranges. Um, <clears throat> so having traps in your range effectively uncaps your range. Uh, but the other way it, it helps is that when he thinks your range is capped, and he tries to exploit you for having a capped range, and you actually have the nuts, he loses a lot of money right then and there. Um, and that's the way all of these things work. <clears throat> it's like, uh, it works really well when your opponent doesn't know that you've got this part, uh, like this hand. He, if, For instance, if you've been open raising a very tight range from under the gun, and your opponent starts to like beat up on you every time the flop comes out like middling and kind of connected and suited, uh, and you start open raising 7-6 suited from under the gun into full ring game, that's like the, the hand you decide to splash in when that happens. Well, <clears throat> that helps in a couple ways. For one, when the flop does come out 8-9-10, um, uh, and your opponent thinks that your range is capped at like pocket aces, uh, and he tries to put a whole bunch of pressure, and you stack him because you actually have the nuts, um, it helps a lot there. But then also it helps just by way of having your um, opponent catch on to that. Once your opponent knows... Uh, then you don't get those huge wins with it like that anymore, but it stops your opponent from beating up on you every time the flop comes out in a way uh, that is not great for your range. So it gives you better board coverage, better board presence. Um, and those same concepts apply to post-flop. In fact, pre-flop and post-flop need to be really married together to have an overall effective strategy. Um, I wanted to give an example um, but then I, I don't know, I just, I didn't spend an awful lot of time with this, so I don't know if I want to, like, stake my reputation on this being anything like right. But let's just say, if we open the button in a full ring game, we're playing at the local casino, maybe a 2-5 no limit game or a 1-2 no limit game. We'll say split the difference. We're playing a 1-3 game. We open the button for $10, and uh, the big blind calls, and uh, we go heads up to it, and it comes up. Uh, the flop comes out queen of clubs, eight of diamonds, seven of diamonds. So we're going to want to have some hands that continuation bet and then fold to a raise. We're going to have hands that bet and continue versus a raise. And we're going to have hands that uh, check back. Uh, once the, and this is all, all assuming that villain checks to the raiser. Um, uh, but we're going to have to have some hands in our check back range that call once, some that call down. <clears throat> and it's really going to be good if we can have some hands that will check back and then at least some of the time raise when our opponent probes the turn. Um, and then of course we'll need to have some hands to just check back and give up. If we don't have all of those and we're imbalanced then our opponent can take advantage of us and exploit us in one way or another. But we not only have to balance our bluffs versus value and have some traps to protect our capped showdown value type ranges, <clears throat> but uh, we also want to have a, 
a variety of hands in each range for better board coverage, just like we want to have some hands that will splash into our um, early position opening ranges like 7-6 suited. Uh, well, if our opponent catches on to the fact that we're always ski betting our draws, and then we check back some street and the turn produces the third card. Like let's say our opponent knows that we're just always C betting our, uh, our straight draws and our flush draws. Then on this flop of queen eight seven two tone, if we check back with like pocket tens and the turn comes like the, I don't know, whatever, deuce of diamonds, we just always lose that hand, right? Like our opponent can just bomb the turn and like uh, go for a huge overbet on the river and we can like never call them down, right? Um, and he can do that with his nutted value hands and a bunch of air. And there's nothing we can do about it. We will lose in that situation. Except to have some hands in our check back range <clears throat> that uh, either have a drawing portion of them, like, uh, I don't know, a pair uh, with an overcard and three to a straight flush so we can do some calling on some turns, even facing an overbet and some calling and some raising on the river. <clears throat> but really, I think the best hands for that job are going to be uh, hands like uh, combo draws, especially uh, weak queen of diamonds, X of diamonds on this board. Uh, like, we're going to want to probably bet our best ace queen of diamonds, um, but if we have something like, uh, I don't know, queen six of diamonds, uh, we open the button so we can be pretty wide, um, then maybe that's the type of hand we'll want to go ahead and check back and then we can call down pretty effectively um, and uh, we'll be able to raise some turns after checking back and we can call on the flop or check back the flop, call turn and raise river uh, at least some of the time and that's really going to make it hard for our opponent to exploit our game. In fact, it's going to make it impossible for our opponent to exploit our game if we do it right. Um, so maybe uh, on queen eight seven two tone <clears throat> we open button villain called out of the big blind and we're heads up maybe something like checking back our middle pairs and our bottom pairs uh, checking back like pocket nines pocket tens along with some air and a couple of draws <clears throat> especially those pair plus draws and uh, maybe a couple of traps like exactly pocket queens or maybe like pocket aces with the ace of diamonds um, would be like a trap or could be used as a trap on a lot of runouts <clears throat> uh, so then what are we betting? Well, we're going to bet the rest of our sets and maybe some uh, queen-queen combos, uh, some ace-ace combos, like the ace-ace of not diamonds. Um, all of our kings, ace-queen, king-queen, queen-jack, queen-ten, and a lot of draws. And maybe our best air, you know, like uh, king-x, ten of diamonds, king of clubs, jack of clubs, where we've got some things going. We're going to be able to barrel some turns. Uh, we're going to be able to triple barrel some runouts for value and some as a bluff. Um, so, you know, this was a quick, just kind of, uh, sort of my uh, just basic and kind of uh, first thoughts about this uh, texture and situation. Um, but this might be something like the way you look at uh, constructing ranges. And, you know, it's not impossible that two ranges can be different, but as long as they're balanced um, equally well, they can both be... Uh, approximately the same amount of wrong. I mean, nobody's playing a perfect GTO strategy. Nobody knows it. Um, but, you know, you could balance your range one way. I could balance my range another way. And as long as they're both balanced precisely, uh, like, close enough to the same level, uh, then they can both be about the same EV. They can both be very positive EV. They can both be um, pretty good and close to the same EV. Maybe <clears throat> it's not... Uh, I don't think it's too far-fetched that you, you could have one range and I could have one range, and as long as they're balanced um, to about the same degree of accuracy, <clears throat> at about the same distance from Nash equilibrium and not too far away from Nash equilibrium, they could both have identical EV, or something like identical EV. Okay, so just some final thoughts. <clears throat> Try to get the most mileage out of your range by squeezing the most value out of each part that you can. Uh, when things seem close, consider card removal and board coverage. We haven't really talked about card removal, but just think about how the hand you're holding uh, limits the combos of uh, hands that your opponent could be holding. Like, for instance, uh, maybe you want to bluff more often when you've got uh, the ace of diamonds on a three-diamond board. So you've got the nut flush block, and you know your opponent can't have the nuts. So 
uh, he's not going to have a whole lot of very easy calls in a situation like that. So that's a, a removal effect. Um, and uh, think about how you're going to be able to play across the various streets and various runouts. Uh, try to use hands and get the best mileage out of them. They're going to do a lot of work for you when you can. <clears throat> like checking back, um, top pair with a weak kicker uh, and a nut flush draw can be a really good play that can do a lot of good things. It can uh, act as pretty good showdown value against bluffs uh, when you don't make the two pair or trips or uh, you know, flush, <clears throat> nut flush, um, but it can also eventually uh, do some really heavy lifting when you actually hit some turns and or rivers because that not only allows you to value raise with a part of your range that checked back on the flop, but that also then allows you, really necessitates that you have some bluffs in your range when you check back. So that can do a lot of damage to your opponent's strategy. <clears throat> um, right, so generally less showdown value and more equity versus call. Um, EVC, something I use with my students, equity versus calling ranges. Um, these are going to be your best bluffs. The, the less showdown value and the more uh, equity versus your opponent's calling range that you have, the more incentive you have to bluff. Uh, good showdown uh, value gives you less incentive to bluff, <clears throat> whether you have good equity or not. Um, Trying to bet when you're a favorite against villains, villains continuing ranges, uh, and that means a favorite to win at or by showdown, and bet when you would like your opponent to fold. Um, try not to waste bets that don't have a good, well thought out purpose. And really you could talk about bet sizing along these same lines. Everything should be discussed along these same lines and eventually thought of along these same lines. And after that you should play along these lines. Um, consider your range at large, your range as a whole, at every decision point. The closer you come to doing that, um, and, and the more streets ahead you're thinking, the better you are at poker, you know, just bottom line. Um, consider your range at each decision point. And, you know, I think a lot of players, I've brought this up at least once before, I think a lot of players are really good about making sure that their bluffs can look like value hands. They make uh, <clears throat> they go to a lot of effort to make sure that they can rep something reasonably well when they're bluffing. They want their bluffs to make sense. But there is another side to that coin, and that is that your value bets have to look like bluffs. Some of it, well, they ought to look like. You, you <clears throat> think of it this way: if you never have a bluff in a certain spot then your opponent can fold all of his bluff catchers against your value bets. So your whatever hand you're betting for value, if you're playing against a player that can think, it's got to at least be stronger than some of the other hands you bet for value. Um, if not, and preferably, really you should, um, have a bluffing range in any spot you can where you're going to have a value range. I mean, sometimes it just won't work out that way. Um, but those spots should be very infrequent. Uh, sometimes you're going to check and call the flop, your opponent's going to check back on the turn, and you're just going to get to the river with no bluffs. Um, but in those spots, you really can't, against a good thinking player, you can't bet like a marginal hand and expect to get called by worse. You can really only bet very, very strong hands and just hope that your opponent has something to call you with. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I digress. I think that's going to do it for this video. Thanks for watching. Um, hit me up in the comments or... You can uh, send an email to dondoust at gmail.com uh, if you're interested in coaching. Until next time, guys, good luck. Navinat over now.